to introduce our keynote speaker, we have Lee Wilbur, Managing Director, uh, and I'd like to welcome him to the stage now. Thank you very much. Well, it's certainly an honor to, to be with here today. I was chatting with Mike uh, just as we were preparing. He said, let's keep this uh, really short and sweet. So if you want to know all the details, and, and there are a lot of details to know about Mike, he said you can find them all uh, on the web. So I would encourage you to do that. I did want to just share just a couple of thoughts. Uh, one, in my opinion, there are very, very few individuals who can check the boxes of being a scholar, being an accomplished civil servant, and a successful businessman, and, and frankly, even an aviator, uh, the, the way that Mike does. Uh, his, his dedication, his, his willingness to work with people to make a difference in the world around us, again, whether it be uh, from an academic perspective, uh, a government public service perspective, or from an industry perspective is, uh, I believe, unparalleled. Uh, so we're very honored to have him here and, and share some thoughts with us. So with that, Mike, I will turn the podium over to you. Well, that was mercifully short. Thanks. It's not, not quite as good as my favorite intro of all time, which some of you have heard me talk about. There was a guy one time who stood up and introduced me by saying, you can find out more about Mike on Google than he would ever want you to know. <laughs> I thought that was remarkably clever, and so I have remembered it. Wish, wish I'd been the originator. Um, so thanks for inviting me to be here for this um, Friday afternoon keynote. Um, if people have a flight and they need to leave in the middle of my talk, that's okay. And if you need that as a good excuse to leave in the middle of my talk, that's, that's okay. You know, I've been to that movie. Um, I love the title of, of um, this conference, you know, going to the moon, returning to the moon and, and beyond. Um, I, uh, <clears throat> when I was uh, talking with Jim Way about what I should talk about today, Jim suggested I go back to a, a 2007 essay I had written, um, many pages regrettably, um, at the request of um, the editorial board of Aviation Week and Space Technology. And I, I, I wrote it on the way back from a flight to China and, uh, had plenty of time, <laughs> and AWNST put it on their uh, on their website, and they've told me since it's been one of the most downloaded things they ever had, which um, always surprised me. But nice to hear. So Jim asked me to kind of reprise that, think about you know what what was right, what wasn't right, and what I would say with the, um, the passage of 16 years since I published that essay. So I went back and reread it, and I realized that I wasn't a good writer then, and I'm still not a good writer now. <laughs> and that's, that's probably a feature rather than a bug, uh, because, because I'll, I'll just have to own it. Um, but there were some interesting things in there, some things I, I did get right. So I started at that essay out by, um, trying, and I wrote it, of course, while I was still at NASA, and one of the things that I would hear all the time from inside NASA and from outside NASA was that, well, it would be great if we just had funding like what we had in the Apollo years. We could really do stuff. And I, for, for a long time, starting as a younger man, I actually thought that was a true statement. But then, regrettably, uh, the engineer that is 99.5% of who I am questioned that assertion, and I went back, and for this, for this particular essay, I went back and analyzed at that time, um, uh, you know, almost, well, 45 years of NASA budgets, and adjusted for inflation, it turned out that the Apollo, you, and depending on, and I did it for two segments. I did it for 10-year chunks, 
or three 15-year chunks for 45 years, and it didn't matter which chunk you used, the Apollo years were not the decade in which we, or the era in which we got the most money. Not. We had more inflation-adjusted money uh, in the years that, that I was at NASA, and in the 15 years since, we've had even more inflation-adjusted money than Apollo ever had. Apollo got it all at once, which allowed the Apollo generation, uh, the people who trained me, um, it allowed them to do things in parallel that today we have to do in series because the budget is metered out more or less constantly and has been for quite some time, leaving aside this year's cut from the Congress because it doesn't look like we know what we're doing. Um, but doing things in parallel versus series over the longer term really doesn't make any difference. I mean, it matters as you hair gets grayer or like me, you lose it. But in the long run, looking back at what a society has done, a few years where you did stuff in parallel as opposed to in series because of peak versus level budgets doesn't really make any difference. So if you look at it, we have now an unblemished history of getting more money for space exploration every 10 or 15 years, and I, I say 15 because the Apollo era is really from 1958 through 73 when we flew Skylab. You know, we started Mercury in 58 and flew Skylab in 73. So the Apollo era was really 15 years long, and we've had more money in every 15-year chunk since then than we had then. So what's our excuse? I don't think, I think this is actually where the enlisted man is supposed to say no excuse, sir, because we have no excuse as a country. I'm, 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 not, I'm not even putting the finger on NASA because as a former administrator, I know quite well you are the administrator, not the creator. You're told to, to do what you are told by the combination of the White House and the Hill as best you can do it, but you know, you're lucky if they take your advice. Uh, you, get a, you, you get a prescription, you don't write the prescription. Um, but as a nation, we have much to, I think, much to apologize for. Um, one of the things that I got right in that essay, uh, aside from the regrettable fact about my, my budget analysis, um, another of the things I got right was that I pointed out that it was going to be a huge upsurge in commercial space, um, which certainly has happened. Uh, we've had sessions at this conference about that. I want to talk a little bit more about that in a bit, um, but, but certainly that has come true. <clears throat> but in that essay, I talked about the value of constancy of purpose, of having, you know, if, if the difference if looking back over the long term, there's no real difference between what you can accomplish when you're doing things in parallel with a bunch of money over a short term versus in series with the same amount of money over a longer period. If there's no real difference, then are we any closer to the moon than we were when I wrote that essay or when we were in 1973 for that matter? And the answer is no, we're not. I would argue that we're farther away. I would argue that we've lost ground, um, which I frankly hate to say. Um, why do I think that? I have several reasons, um, and I'm not going to talk for the whole 45 minutes. I'm going to give you guys time to grill me when we're done. But uh, I have several reasons. One is... Um, I, I get real tired of people thinking that you're going to get far beyond low Earth orbit without heavy lift space launch. I don't fundamentally care who builds it because it's been a long time since I was a source selection official. Uh, so I don't fundamentally care who builds it. But while it is true that I, I love a, an analogy Wayne Hale once used on this point. Um, he said, you know, you could have done the Berlin airlift with a thousand Piper Cubs, 
but it probably wouldn't have worked out all that well. Um, we used bigger airplanes than that. Um, and there's a reason. There's a reason that we move oil around the world in, in super tankers, and we move cargo container ships around the world in the biggest ships you'll ever see. And there's a reason why people own, you know, sailboats that can be managed by one person at the other end of the spectrum. One size doesn't fit all. It's true in any form of transportation that we have. And, you know, if you want to put a small um, unmanned satellite in low Earth orbit for scientific purposes, and plenty of people do, I, I serve as a director for, of Rocket Lab, which has a very successful small launcher for just that purpose. That's not a vehicle you want to use to assemble 100 metric tons in orbit to go to the moon. And, I, and I, I get tired of people who think that that's not the case. So it, it took us at least two and a half, as a nation, at least two and a half times as long to put together the SLS as a heavy lifter to succeed the Saturn V as it took to develop the Saturn V. No excuse, sir, okay? And it isn't about one company, it's not about one center, it's not even about one agency, it's about how we do things as a nation. And it's ridiculous. Um, the lunar architecture is burdened by a gateway to nowhere. It takes delta V to get into it, it takes delta V to get out of it, to get back to exactly where you were before. I mean, excuse me, I, I think I missed something. Now, let me be on record. I have absolutely no objection as a, someone who used to make his living as a space system engineer. I have absolutely no objection to a transportation node in lunar orbit to facilitate humans and, and cargo going to and from the moon. I, I think it's a good idea. I wouldn't have put it first uh, any more than I would have, you know, established uh, uh, established a fort on the west coast prior to Lewis and Clark making their expedition. But, so while I wouldn't have put a transportation node in lunar orbit first, it's, it's okay that it's there. But could we pick a useful orbit? I mean, we have a stupid orbit. Uh, that's the best way I can put it. Um, if you want to concentrate on the lunar poles, and I think that's a good thing to do given everything we've learned since Apollo, um, again, that wouldn't be my first trip back to go to the hardest place, but leave that aside. If you want to concentrate on the lunar poles, then you want a transportation node in lunar polar orbit at an altitude that the orbit dynamicists have found to be among the more stable ones, to need the least, you know, the lesser amount of, of orbit maintenance fuel. And there are such orbits. Um, so what are we doing with the orbit that the gateway is in? It's just... To an engineer, it makes no sense. Um, we've got three crew vehicles developed, not one of which can get into and out of lunar orbit unassisted. Uh, I, don't, I don't think I need to add to that comment. It doesn't take us closer to the moon. Um, and we haven't bothered to develop the kick stage that would get any of the three of them into or and slash out of lunar orbit uh, with a kick stage. So again, what are we doing? More broadly, leaving aside details of, of the space systems architecture that I just plain don't like. Um, sorry, I, I'm, an, I'm an engineer at birth. I haven't changed. And some designs are good and some designs are not good. The Ford Trimotor was a bad design. The Douglas DC-3 built right around the same time was a great design. The Ford Trimotor is in museums. The DC-3 is still flying. Okay. Uh, a, an important part of being a good engineer is to understand the difference between a Ford Trimotor and a DC-3 and why that matters. Moving on, there are larger issues in play that are preventing us as a nation from doing what we need to do in space. I want to return in a moment to why we need to do it. Um, the first of those is the, in my view, regrettable um, square wave flip from it's all government all the time in space to if it isn't commercial, you know, why are we bothering to do it? 
those are the, you know, we, I, I grew up in the all government all the time uh, uh, space world, both civil and national security. And now you basically, as a government employee, have to prove that you can't possibly do what you want commercially before you're allowed to do anything in the government. Both those extremes are wrong. When I was running NASA, I instituted the COTS, the Commercial Orbital Transportation Services Program, because I thought that at that time, industry was ready, without assistance from the government, to develop space transportation capable of putting 10 or so metric tons of cargo in orbit, and that the government didn't need to be doing that anymore. I was right. I thought at the time that the government, that industry was not ready to put humans in space, despite how much they were claiming that they were ready to do it. And I, I, I used to make the joke that before I'm going to authorize a commercial humans in space program, I want to see them carry the laundry that the crew would wear. Uh, again, I think I was right. The, the, the leading contender, SpaceX, was years late getting to orbit. Um, Boeing hasn't made it yet. Um, they weren't ready. Uh, and as a consequence, the United States space program was not ready. Um, that's regrettable. So when I say I don't like either extreme, um, I, think it's a, I think it is very important for a fundamentally an engineering organization like NASA, and I could say the NRO, and I could say NOAA, and I could say many other, you know, the, the U.S. Space Force, uh, Space Systems Command, I could cite many other organizations in government that are fundamentally technical in nature. Fundamentally, they're engineering development organizations. They are in charge of taking taxpayer money and converting it into product. And you cannot do that as an engineer if you cannot bring to the table your own hands-on experience. If you, if you have not done it yourself and not made your own mistakes, you cannot be an adequate judge of how the taxpayer's money should be spent on things that others are doing. You have no right to sit in a design review and critique their design because you don't know what the hell you're talking about. Now, hands-on work takes many different forms. Um, when I was a very young engineer, you know, my job was to wire up during the Vietnam War, which only a few like myself here remember. Uh, my job was to wire up mine detectors that older engineers brought to me with a circuit diagram that mostly would be wrong. And my, my job was to wire up their mine detector, put it on my back, and then walk around a field with simulated mines and see how well it worked. I got really good at electronics assembly. <laughs> <laughs> I never got really good at walking around the field with a heavy pack on my back. I'm just not built for that kind of thing. Um, later on, I, you know, like many of us here, I wrote all kinds of software. Um, I worked in a wind tunnel, gathering data, th things that all of, many of us have done. The, the point is, if you haven't, as I sometimes joke about, if, if you haven't worked on cars and dropped your own spark, spark plug down inside your own engine and then had to deal with getting it out, you do not understand engineering. And you have no right to, to judge others, critique others. You have no right to spend the taxpayer's money on products that are being brought, brought into capability for the national good. So policymakers have no right no sensible uh, reason to deprive government civil servants of the, uh, of the necessity of doing a certain amount of the work themselves in order that they can properly allocate how taxpayer money is to be spent. So uh, it seems to me that across government agencies, and I've had some visibility into quite a few, it seems to me that we have gone to the other end of the spectrum where we farm out everything we do to a commercial entity whose fundamental job on behalf of their investors and stockholders is to maximize their own gain. Now, I am a right-wing, free market capitalist of the first order. I'm totally, you know, the reason why we are 4% of the world's population controlling 25% of its wealth is because of capitalism. So I'm an unabashed supporter of people's right to pursue their self-interest. 
I'm also an unabashed supporter of, you know, in government we take taxpayer money and we convert it to product. I want to see it done well. It cannot be done well if government civil servants have, do not have the background required to do it properly. In engineering, that means you have, have to have made your own mistakes. So I, I argue that the trend toward commercial has been overdone. I also argue that the definition of commercial has been perverted by people for their own self-interest. Commercial means I have an idea that's better than your idea. I go out, I seek investment to support realizing that idea. I gather up that money. I search for customers. I try to get customers to pay me something up front you know, to, to help me over the hump, like when you buy a house, the contractor doesn't build the whole house for you and then you pay at the end. So, you know, I, I'm okay with the customers providing some money as you go along, but it's an arms, it's what we call an arm's length transaction. If it's commercial, I'm not telling you how to build the house. I, I hired you because I thought you knew, but I'm not telling you how to build it. Um, that's exactly the opposite of government responsibility. The Navy isn't asking um, shipbuilders how to design the Columbia-class submarine. The Navy's designing the Columbia-class submarine, and they should. So until we can return to the proper definition of commercial, we're, we're going to be kidding ourselves. What we have today are people who say we want to do commercial space. What they really mean is, I want the government to hand me a bunch of money to do something that we actually need done, but I don't want to have to follow the rules of the big five prime contractors because, you know, that makes me slow and stupid. Well, I agree, nobody should have to follow all those rules. Government has become bloated and, and just wrong, but we need to change the rules for everybody. The rules don't just get changed because you're not one of the big five prime contractors and you would like to do commercial space. It's only commercial if you raised all the money yourself, brought the product to the market, and then sold it for all the traffic would bear. That's commercial. Um, to that point, a related uh, item on that point is our acquisition system across government is broken. That's not a new revelation. You can see comments like that in every issue of breaking defense or space news or aviation week or anything you want to read. It's all true. Acquisition system's broken. Um, we don't need to take 16 years to buy a new space product. Now, I want to congratulate Derek Tournier, who used to work for me, for running the Space Development Agency in a way to prioritize schedule. You know, we need to instill in, in government acquisition managers to include the engineering side of that you know, to take in the data that they can, make decisions based on the data they can get, and move on. The cost of the mistakes is less than the cost of the 16 years that it takes to do it the way we're doing it now. Now, we're a sovereign nation. We make up our own rules. We don't have these rules imposed on us by the Almighty. We don't have these rules imposed upon us by another nation. Okay, so there needs to be a drumbeat about how we used to buy things, okay? Um, I, I, can give, I can give too many examples, um, but I will give one, one of my favorites. Um, this country's most outstanding aircraft program ever was the X-15, rocket-powered airplane to investigate hypersonic flight set a record at the time that still stands, Mach 6.7 in, in manned aircraft flight. They didn't get to use the airplane again, but they did get to Mach 6.7. Um, the X-15 program ran from the mid-1950s to um, the late 1960s, executed 199 flights in 11 years from a standing start. I, today, I can't imagine, you know, I, I'm sure it would take 11 years to get the paperwork done. So we need to look to the past, things that this nation did, that this nation gave itself permission to do and return to that environment. 
and this is not, that's not a one person job. I don't care what agency you run. Uh, I wouldn't care how much, how powerful a senator that you were. I mean, it, it doesn't even matter if you're the president. Um, as Eisenhower once famously said, I give orders and nothing happens. <laughs> so I'm familiar with that phenomenon, but this is something that we as a people need to dedicate ourselves to. Um, with that, I'll stop. Uh, I've outlined some things that I think are wrong, but which are, I believe are correctable, but until and unless they're corrected, we're not going to be going back to the moon, we're not going to Mars. I said I would take a, a minute or two to comment on why that matters. Look, I said earlier that I was tired of people who, who thought you could get usefully below low Earth orbit without a heavy lifter. Um, I am. I'm also tired of people who think NASA is a civilian agency. It's a civilian agency because Eisenhower wanted to distinguish this, quote, civil space program from the military space program as a response to the Soviet Union. But in practical terms, NASA is a national security agency. It is there to demonstrate um, the superiority of the American way of doing important things over other approaches. So that was Kennedy's goal during Apollo, and it should be this nation's goal now in the era of the rise of China and President Xi in China who routinely makes statements, public statements, that the Western democracies are um, bankrupt, have lost their way, are decadent. Uh, he asserts his intention that China should be the world's superpower. Um, when people tell you they're out to get you, maybe you should pay attention. Um, you know, maybe he'll die first and China will revert. I, I, I'm, it's not how I want to place my the bet. I don't want to place my bet on that hand. Okay. The consequences to the world order of China being on the moon when the United States cannot even get there are profound. They will be profound. Um, I'm old, but I expect to be alive when they land, and I want us to be there to greet them, uh, not watching it on TV. NASA is a national security agency. Every aspect of our space program, meaning taxpayer-funded space program, I'm not talking about commercial comsats, which are, are great, but that's not what I'm talking about. Every aspect of our taxpayer-funded space program, whether it's a black program at the NRO or a uh, a civilian scientific robotic mission to Mars is a national security program because it's about the standing of the United States in the global arena. That is what it's about. And if we can do some useful things in conjunction with that, I think that's great. Okay? I worked on Hubble, as I've said many times to different groups. I'm proud of having worked on Hubble. It was awesome. Okay? But sorry, scientists, Hubble's a national security program. It's about we're better than you. And if that sounds jingoistic, I don't care. <laughs> Over to questions. Hey, Mike enjoyed your talk. Curious about your thoughts on the NASA DARPA partnership on the Draco project. Well, as as I see it, the NASA DARPA thing is about DARPA giving NASA a slap upside the head to to get them moving out. Uh, I'm delighted with the partnership on nuclear rocketry, as everyone who knows anything I ever said uh, understands that I'm a huge supporter of of a nuclear upper stage. Um, we had one, 50, literally 50 years ago, shut it, shut it down. We need another one. I'm, I'm glad that's going on. But it shouldn't take DARPA to get, to get, it shouldn't take, I'm not even going to pick on NASA because that's not fair. It shouldn't take DARPA to get the nation on the right course about exploring space. Next question. Hi. Uh, so I I enjoy your talk. I also enjoyed the talk about how I, I just enjoy it in general. Anyway, what are your 
opinions on like the current HLS, the human landing system options, because I have some concerns about Starship, and yeah. Well, I don't, I don't know enough about, um, I, I don't know enough about Starship or or Jeff Bezos' entry into the competition, the New Glenn. I don't know enough about them to offer an intelligent comment. Um, I haven't been asked to participate in any design reviews for those. I, I would say that um, if th this is an example of the excessive use of commercial space, if the nation wants to, uh, why, if, if Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos want to spend their own money on going to the moon and they want to call it commercial, have at it. It's not my money. Be my guest, enjoy yourselves. Um, no amount of, of even successful commercial activity is the same as a program operated on behalf of the American people um, to take the United States and its partners and allies that we sorely need back to the moon. They're, they're not substitutes. I, I, I would not be in favor of a proposal to outsource the Marines to a mercenary outfit. I'm not going to outsource the Marines to the Wagner Group, is, is my analogy. So, so if, if multi tens of billionaires want to spend money going to the moon or Mars, uh, I, I truly would like to see it. I hope they succeed. It is not a substitute for, you know, national will. Yes, ma'am. Dr. Griffin, I'm curious of your I'm thought. I'm Mike, always. Mike. <laughs> Uh, I'm curious your thoughts on any potential difficulties NASA may be having on uh, On the what? I, louder. Oh, any difficulties NASA may be having on recruitment due to the competitive offers that no commercial industries can provide comparatively. Uh, I get that question a lot, not just about NASA, but about government service in general because I spent way too much of, of my life in government service. Um, so it's this simple. When you're doing leading edge things, um, like I'm saying we should be doing, you do not have any trouble recruiting the best of the best at whatever the salary is. Um, my now business partner, Dr. Lisa Porter, and I went to back to, uh, and, uh, as, and she was my deputy as an undersecretary and worked for me previously at NASA. Uh, we went back into government in 2018 um, for what I, I consider to be tip money now, okay, I mean, I, I literally couldn't pay all my expenses with the salary that we were making because we were making less than all the people who worked for us as, as a consequence of, of decisions made in the Obama administration about political appointees' salaries. So I, I couldn't even pay my own expenses for my family. Um, but I did it because it was an opportunity to help influence the, you know, the nation's cutting edge. And all the people we hired came with us, could say the same thing. I mean, they weren't paying expenses, but they were doing it for the national good and for the challenge it offered. You don't have any trouble recruiting great people for great enterprises. If, if NASA were, again, doing great things, trust me, we could hire whoever we wanted. Hello, Dr. Mike. Uh, my name is Sainanad. <laughs> okay, hi, Mike. <laughs> my name is Sainanad. I'm with the electrical department from UAH. So I hear you. I, uh, I understand the budgetary issues NASA has from what it was 40 years ago, where you had money parallelly coming in for every project. And, but what I know is for the Artemis mission, NASA is going to spend $93 billion. If you look towards the east, Japan, UAE, they are doing these missions, most of the, their missions, at a very less and cheaper cost. I have purposefully not used the word India because I know that they are doing these missions at the money, what you call tip money, because India had their Mars mission done in, for $74 million. NASA spent $600 million. Isn't it time for NASA to evolve with change? I mean, why are you worried about why Chinese pres what Chinese pres president is speaking? After India landed in the South Pole, the first statement that came out of China is, India never landed in South Pole. What I did was I celebrated it. 
because that was the biggest achievement for us, right? So isn't it time for NASA to evolve and re-strategize their things? Things are changed, things have changed, time has changed, we got to move on. Uh, I understand that I'm not trying to diminish your problems. It is, it is an issue. Yeah, but yeah, I was going to say, you, you're making you a speech. Well, yeah. I need, I need right. a question. If you want to say, yeah. if you want me to say that NASA spends too much money to do yeah. what it does. Yes, that's exactly my question. Okay. Thank you. I would remind you that NASA doesn't actually spend the money. The money is spent at large contractors on behalf of the taxpayer, and it is being poorly administered by NASA and by the rest of the US government as well because we're not getting the value for the money that we should. That's absolutely the case. And this is what I mean by you know making, making expert decisions by people qualified to make them. All right. So I once read about this program by a SpaceX ironically called Red Dragon, which was effectively an all-in-one mission package for what, you know, curiosity, perseverance, uh, the ESA rover, that's when to pick up a Perseverance's samples. I heard that, you know, basically, Red Dragon pretty much uh, threatened JPL's business model because it was pretty much all the missions in one and in a much cheaper package. What do you think of, like, the ramifications of private corporations, you know, pretty much outclassing older organizations that are more tried and trusted? I mean... Organizations are disrupted by new organizations all the time. I mean, that's a good thing. I mean, I, I'm sure everybody's read, well, I'm not sure everyone has read it. Many people here have read Christensen's book about disruption. So uh, if, if a, let me be careful with my words, if a US government program in any area uh, is put up for competitive bid, then I want the best competitor to win, okay? I don't want them to win because they have better lobbying connections on the Hill, you know? I, I don't want them to win because, you know, they know the president. I, I want them to win because they have the best offering and I don't care which company it is. I don't own stock in any of them. So, what do I think? I don't know anything about Red Dragon. I didn't and never heard the words before you said them, and, and I don't care. My point would be, as an example, if we want to do a Mars mission, we should space, we, and it's being paid for by taxpayer money, the government should specify what it wants and put it up for bid and see who wins. And it should be, it should be managed by people who are qualified to do so. Um, back to my earlier point. So I'm, I'm not here to either uh, praise or damn any specific company as, as uh, from, uh, from uh, I come to bury Caesar not to praise him <laughs> from, from the play. So uh, anyway, done or one? Well, thank you very much. Out of time. Okay. Thank you very, Thanks. very much, Mike. We appreciate it.